Hi everyone, my name is Araceli, aka Chelly, and today on Chelly's Mental Wealth, we're gonna be talking about autism. I was first introduced to autism when I worked with intellectually disabled adults, and I worked as a pretty much a living instructor, and I kind of helped adults live a normal life. I also have had a lot of experience working with children. I've had a handful of clients who are autistic, depending on their ages. It, be, it was between maybe I would say five to eight years old. So, and I was a community wellness specialist. I was a community wellness specialist about four years and eight months. I specialize in basically behavioral health therapy. And I was a specialist who helped children and teens who struggled with depression, anxiety, on top of being diagnosed with mental disabilities or disorders such as ADHD, autism, that's just kind of to give you an idea as to what type of experience I have in the mental health field. So hopefully it can give you an understanding of what I know and why I know some of these things and what I'm gonna talk about in today's video. Now I did write a script. <laughs> Look at this, this is the first time I do this because it's a lot of information, a lot of information that I utilize that I've obtained from working in the field and also to just the books that I've read and the classes that I took when I was trying to pursue a master's degree, which I decided not to anymore. I might change my mind. So what am I gonna talk about? Yes, it's gonna be about autism, but what exactly am I gonna talk about in regards to autism? First, I'm gonna talk about just the overall definition of autism, just to help people understand what autism is when you read it in a textbook. I'm also gonna discuss symptoms and behaviors that a child or teen might exhibit, even an adult, if they are autistic. The other thing I'm also gonna talk about is TBS. TBS is basically an acronym word that is for Therapeutic Behavioral Services. And this is a special program that I used to, well, I didn't I provide, I was a part of when, I, when we would provide mental health services with families, with the mental health organization that I used to work for. Now, this program was very intense and I am gonna go a little into detail once I talk into the specific, you know, program that we did because with that program it allowed us to figure out what the goals were basically the behaviors and symptoms that were not allowing them to be able to reach their overall goals it will highlight the caregivers and teachers aid strengths when a child is autistic I'm gonna talk about triggers that I noticed that maybe autistic children or teens may deal with that may cause certain reactions I'm going to talk about interventions interventions is the, is the cheese is the cake this is what's gonna help reduce the triggers and the triggers are basically responses that an autistic person might respond that's not making them be successful in life and i'll get into the triggers and you'll understand what i mean by because when you know your own triggers because anyone has triggers okay when you know your own triggers that's when you're going to be able to work work on them and figure out how to reduce the triggers and figure out how to not have the trigger anymore you know let it have power that's the main thing and the last thing well, actually still a few things um, barriers. There's a lot of barriers that might, you might encounter when you are autistic or you're dealing with any type of mental disorder or men mental illness, or as I like to call it, mental, just mental barriers in general, and highlights and successes that you might obtain or you might see and observe once you start to implement all these things and stuff that you've learned. And these are things that I've noticed when I used to work with my clients that we used to see successes and highlights. So I put in all the successes and highlights that I was able to observe when we used to provide these services to our clients, okay? And the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is basically the adult experience that I had when I provided services to adults that were autistic because I think it's important that, we, that, that I share that information to anyone as an adult or any family member that might have an autistic ch child that's gonna become an adult to be aware of just what might happen or the things that you could be prepared for when the person is an adult. And last but not least, the negative outcomes. I wanted to leave the negative outcomes at the end because I did observe a lot of negative things that I think people should be aware of, whether you're the one that's autistic or you're a family member, to hopefully you can keep the person safe or you can keep yourself safe so that you won't get taken advantage of or a family member or a friend that you may know can get cannot get taken advantage of. So it's important. This is why I want to share all this stuff. So let's get started. So what is autism spectrum disorder? What is it? So in the Abnormal Psychology book, 6th edition, it explains that it involves impairment in two fundamental behavioral domains, which is deficits in social interactions, communications, 
and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities. Now I'm going to talk about just certain symptoms and behaviors that are just more specific to the autism diagnosis. A lot of symptoms and behaviors can definitely vary depending on the child, depending on the severity of the spectrum because there is high and low spectrum. And usually when it's really um, low spectrum, it means that the, the diagnosis is really intense and they need a lot of help and assistance. And when they're high functioning, that means that it's it's not as difficult for them to do those routines that you have to do every day. They just need a little bit more help, a little bit more assistance, and that'll help them get through their regular routines as a child and transferring over as a teen as an adult. Infants with autism spectrum disorder may not smile or respond to caregivers or initiate play with the caregivers. They may not want to cuddle with parents even when they're frightened. Now, this doesn't apply with a lot of kids, okay? Well, I don't wanna say a lot of kids. It doesn't apply to every child. Some children who are autistic maybe could be um, affectionate. So I don't want people to just hyper-focus on this because it is a possibility that your child could be still affectionate even though they are diagnosed with autism. Other early symptoms may include delayed language with development, when they're a bit older, children with autism spectrum disorder may not be interested in playing with other children, preferring I like prefer, preferring a solitary play, which means they just want to play by themselves. The other thing is they also do not seem to react to other people's emotions because they just don't know how to interpret if you're smiling, if you're sad. They rather not play with children, but rather play with their toys. You know, it's kind of like they want to be independent. They want to be alone. I'm just going to hang out with my Legos, hang out over here. <laughs> when they're in school, they just want to be by themselves. They don't want to be around anyone. They don't want them to be around their space. You know, get out of my way. This is my space <laughs> type of thing. You're going to start to see stuff like that, which in my opinion, I don't think it's wrong. But, to each one. but those are signs, you know what I mean? Those are little signs that you're going to see. And they are preoccupied with one feature or toy or an object. It's very common. I used to see that when I used to um, provide services to an adult. They get very, very attached to an item and they'll have it in their hand or, or have it in a specific place. And if it's moved and it's not there, it really becomes stressful for them. And it becomes something where they're not going to feel comfortable and safe until that thing is where it needs to be. Routines and rituals often are extremely important to children with autism spectrum disorder. They may become excessively frightened or highly distressed. Now, to give an example about that is one of the things that I used to observe is when routines and certain things used to, used to change, it would be really difficult for them, really hard. Um, and an example that I can give you is kind of moving to another school or moving to another home or knowing that a person passed away, things like that, like something something completely different that they're not used to because routines is it's, it's a big deal you know i mean it's a big deal for everyone <laughs> when you really think about it like we love routines they just love routines a lot more than the average person and i personally don't think that's bad but those are things that you're gonna see that's gonna be out of the ordinary some children have repetitive behaviors using some part of their body such as increasing flapping their hands banging their hands and head against the wall and now that could become very dangerous. That's when you're gonna. That's when you do see children or teens have the helmet to make sure that, that they don't hurt themselves because they're gonna start like hitting themselves because it's by, it's a repetitive behavior. It's a routine, and it's just because they're low spectrum. It's difficult for them to control their repetitive and routine. And imagine if you take that routine away from them, it's gonna make them really upset. So that's why um, it's important for them to wear a, a helmet when they have an aggressive repetitive routine. See how, was, you know, I kind of put all those three together. And the last thing that it says here is the behavioral sometimes is referred to as self stimulatory behaviors under the assumption that these children engage in such behaviors for self-stimulation. So basically, like, um, I know that I've heard a lot, a lot of the times uh, when, when I used to hear language and therapy language, because I'm not a therapist, you guys, I was basically working hand in hand and treat with working in treatment teams with therapists, social workers, teachers, parents, when we were providing services. And a lot of the therapists would use examples like oral is fixation. I think I said that right. And so they're constantly like putting things in their mouth and it's a routine. It's, it's a, it, it makes them feel good. You know, it makes them relax, um, makes them de-stress. So, uh, that's why a lot of the times you can always replace that asphyxiation with something else. And that's when you kind of have to do a lot of trial and error, trying different things when it comes out to interventions and coping skills. And that's what we're going to get into. And so now we're going to talk about the therapeutic behavioral services that, that we used to provide with 
the organization I used to work for. It was part of a treatment team and I was basically the specialist and you're there three times a week, about four hours at a time. So you're there three times a week and when you're there, you're there for about four hours with the family, with the child, and it could be in the home or it could be in the school, wherever the child is exhibiting struggles or behaviors and um, needs help and assistance, that's where my four hours are going to be distributed. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. It's not four hours, you guys. It was actually three hours. So three hours I was there. Three, okay? And the main thing was to basically really observe and try to figure out what is it that's triggering the child and what are the things that maybe the family or the child is not seeing where the out, outside person can maybe see and catch and maybe help them resolve and fix and provide them tools so that they can fix whatever they're struggling with and i wasn't on, only providing services but a, the therapist was also talking to him once a week and then we were also having monthly meetings up until the 90 day and every time we would have a meeting we would have a tbs sheet where we would describe the goals the strengths the things that they needed to work on interventions and scoping skills the barriers highlights and successes and just the overall progress that the child was making with the family members so that's kind of like the process that i'm going to use like if i'm providing a tbs meeting and i'm going to be reading everything as a whole with everything that i've learned and all the clients that i have and the things that i've realized that are strengths certain things that they can work on and just triggers and interventions and all that stuff so hopefully i'm making sense because i feel like i'm not <laughs> so reduction to goals one of the things that we used to talk about during TBS is what are the goals? It usually we focused on physical aggression, verbal aggression, and we would focus on defiant behaviors, which means just um, struggling with the following directions. Okay, and one of the one of the common things that you would you would hear a lot when someone would be autistic and they would struggle with it would be kind of like throwing things, spitting, pushing, just being very physically aggressive. And this can vary depending on the child, depending on the age, and also it depends on what the child is being modeled. You know, sometimes it's not really the child's fault and it's sometimes what they see, how they're being um, disciplined, uh, because we don't know if some of these children are being physically abused. You know, we're hoping that families are being honest, you know, and um, being honest about the type of inter interventions and strategies that you're using to help the child succeed or reduce certain behaviors. But we also have to be realistic that sometimes there's going to be certain behaviors that they're going to observe and they're going to mimic and let's figure out where that's coming from so we can reduce it and take accountability and you know help fix the situation you know um now going back to the verbal aggression that's the same thing it could maybe the family member is being too aggressive maybe the teacher's being too aggressive you know maybe they're watching certain television or tv shows that's uh modeling that behavior which is uh, which is teaching the autistic child to behave that way that could be a factor too or maybe it's another child in the school system that is behaving that way and the child is just mimicking that behavior that could also be an issue or it could be an, an uh a trigger towards certain behaviors um so with verbal aggression it could be cursing you know it could be saying i don't want to talk or i hate you or um i'm going to kill you certain things like that could be said it's alarming you know and if your child is going through something like that it just it's okay and just just know that there's help out there and there's ways to help the child because it's a lot of the times it's something a lot more deeper than what they're really truly saying you know um and it's gonna take time it'll take a long time for the child to feel comfortable enough to finally open up and that's with anyone whether you're adult teen or child it takes time. It takes time for you to trust a professional. It takes time for you to feel comfortable to finally open up about certain things. It just takes time. Now, lastly, defiant behavior is something that we focus on on, TB on TBS services. Defiant behavior could look as not wanting to follow directions at school, not following directions, or not wanting to, to listen to your mom or your dad or your caregiver, your foster, foster family, foster siblings, or just anyone in general. You just don't want to follow directions. You could care less for any rules. You just, you, you follow your own stuff. <laughs> Um, sometimes that could be a good thing, but other thing, other times, obviously, you know, in, in a school setting, it doesn't really work well. You kind of have to follow some, some rules for you to be successful. And this is when we come into play as mental health professionals to try to help support and provide certain tools and certain things that we couldn't, that they may not see, or maybe certain information that they haven't heard, or it's just a, sometimes it's just the same information you're kind of repeating and showing families. And it's just because they've heard it so many times from other people and then when they hear it from other professionals it's kind of like oh okay maybe 
this person is is trying to be helpful or maybe this person is telling me useful information that i can apply um because a lot of the times that used to happen a lot of the times we used to provide certain things we, were, we would repeat certain things that other professionals would repeat and then they would listen to us um and like i said a lot of the times it's not really because they didn't want to believe them or oh, it is i mean it's just different factors but just don't be so hard on yourself the thing is is repeating you're explaining in different ways as a professional and as a parent and hopefully it, it clicks you know sometimes people are just not ready and sometimes that's a big factor and now one of the strengths that i used to notice when i used to provide services or when i used to work with kids and adults is even though they says that that sometimes when you're autistic you may not be affectionate or you just don't understand certain emotions some kids that i work with were actually really affectionate really affectionate um so they still could be affectionate and very caring when they're autistic um, they're very curious they're extremely smart and organized athletic very athletic they're very strong I'm willing to learn you know when you're super supportive and you're there they're absolutely willing to learn of course when they're low functioning it's a lot harder because the cognitive ability is a lot more lower but consistency is key and support is key it's super with anyone and crafty i think that people who are autistic are extremely craft crafty and they're extremely creative in different aspects so if you have a child that's autistic they have very special abil abilities that you probably are going to start to see as they start to get older. I feel like being autistic in a high spectrum is, is a gift, in my opinion. Now I'm going to talk about the caregivers and teachers' strengths. These are things that are going to help the child be successful if they're dealing with certain barriers and behaviors and symptoms that they can't seem to overcome. Being affectionate and loving is something that's extremely important. As a parent, as a teacher, as an aide, as a caregiver, as anyone who's there for the child being affectionate and loving is super super essential okay open to suggestions that's huge open to constructive criticism opening being open to doing different things you know so to help figure out what's gonna help the child to the best fit that they can or with their abilities and where they're at the time being receptive to services and new approaches whether the teacher is trying to teach you or the principal or the mental health professional or the behavioral specialist, just being open to the suggestions they're gonna provide if you're going to uh, start to um, get services and help. Um, implementing a routine and reward systems and consequences consistently. That helps tremendously with any child, with any type of disorder, or if they're dealing with any mental barriers, whether they're depressed or anxious, being consistent with routines, reward system, and cons consequences is important. It'll help them tremendously. Um, now, triggers. I wanted to talk about triggers because triggers are basically things that'll make them feel more uncomfortable. And, and it, it's being aware of the triggers will help the child and teen and the family member be more aware, self-aware, and also more helpful when they get triggered so they can reduce the trigger and it, it won't be a trigger anymore and at least it can find solutions for the triggers so, so it doesn't escalate and it becomes something where they might be in danger to themselves or others a trigger that i've noticed when someone is autistic could be when you redirect them with a loud tone of voice loud noises is something that could be a trigger for someone who's autistic it it, it, it irks them but it's just really annoying and just like oh like it's just like ah you know they can't focus so when you're using a loud tone when you're trying to teach them something all they're gonna focus on is the loud tone not what you're saying so be mindful when a child is autistic using a loud tone is gonna be a trigger when the medication is not consistent as a caregiver if you choose to give your child medication it's inconsistent it's going to be a big trigger because they're going through a lot of moods and changes and withdrawals they're not adjusting to the medication and it's, if you're inconsistent with the medication it's it's going to be it's just it's not going to help the situation it's either you choose to be consistent with the medication or you choose not to do the medication if you choose not to do the medication it's possible to be successful it's just takes a it just takes a lot of work and it's a lot it's 10 times harder because you're you're basically the pill you know like the pill does some of the work and then so if you don't utilize the pill you're going to do a lot more work but believe me it's going to be a lot better because it's reducing all the other stuff that might hurt the child or the teen with the pill because you know the reality is 
pills will hurt other organs of your body you know like the liver all that good all that good stuff in your body so if you could do it the natural way and if you are able to do it because financially you're able to do it or you could be the caretaker i would definitely recommend it because it's just it's better to do it holistically but i completely understand if you choose to do medication now when they want to complete a routine and you don't allow them it could be a huge trigger like you have to allow them to complete a routine as long as the routine is safe as long as it's not hurting anyone let them finish their routine it's none of your business let them finish their routine <laughs> if they want to do something let them be you know it's not hurting anyone let them do their routine when peers engage in aggressive behaviors and this could be anyone you guys this could be like i said it could be a family member, someone close to them or not. It could be a friend, it could be a stranger, it could be just a student, it could be a teacher, it could be someone they observe for a split second from another grade or class. If they're engaging in aggressive behavior and that child is constantly seeing it, or if they're watching TV, if they're watching a television show, if they're watching a movie and they're engaging in that behavior, more likely they're going to start behaving that way and it could be a trigger. When they don't get enough space, it could be a huge trigger. Kids that are artistic like their space. That's why some educational, uh, you know, information, they constantly saying that, that they don't like to be affectionate. Well, there's some autistic people that like to be affectionate in their, in their own time, but sometimes they need their space. <laughs> so, but that's, but most of the time they want their space. So just be aware if you're not giving them enough space and they're, sh and they're showing signs like, Hey, give me space, give them their space. When they get jealous, that's what anyone, you know, <laughs> but obviously that's going to be a trick. You know, make sure that you're fair and even with a lot of things and be just be mindful. Like, oh, like if they're being upset about something, just think just, you just as a parent and a caregiver, you have to think to yourself like, hmm, oh, wait, I think they're jealous because as a child, they're, they're probably not going to be able to communicate to you like I'm jealous because of this or I'm feeling a little jelly here. You as a parent or a caregiver could practice on that in a sense of like just being self-aware and thinking, oh, wait, it's because of this or probably jealous let me check in on them let me give them a little bit more attention because i'm paying attention to this situation this child or my new kid or, or my new pet or something like that you just have to be aware that jealousy could be a trigger and that's with any child whether they're autistic or not when they think they're not being honest and that's with anyone you guys i mean as a child a teen whether you're autistic or not if you feel like you're being lied to you're gonna get triggered you're gonna get mad and then it becomes a routine no <laughs> so don't lie loud noises and screams that correlates to the loud noises loud noises is a huge trigger for them if you're screaming if they hear screaming a little tick like it's just there's certain noises that really irritate me too when it's like piercing um just be aware loud noises is a huge huge thing for them when unexpected changes occur that has to do with routines you guys that's what something i've noticed when i worked with adults and children and teens when unexpected changes occurred it was it was hard it was hard but you could definitely be there for them it's just being supportive being there for them it's just hard for them you know and um it could be a huge trigger to a point where they could be very angry and aggressive just be aware that's why it's important if you know that change is going to occur prepare them for that don't let it be so unexpected if you're able to control the reducing the unexpected it'll help a lot but if it's something that's unexpected that you really can't change, like someone just unexpectedly dies, you know, because of a car accident, things like that, kind of like it could be a learning experience for them. These are unexpected things that are going to happen. Let's prepare ourselves for another unexpected things. What can we do when another expected thing happens so that we have a routine? Because they like routines. So it kind of, you could definitely make that into a strength. And not allowing unexpected changes to hinder their ability to still be successful and to not, not allow it to be a trigger anymore. So you could definitely turn that thing around. Um, another thing that I've noticed that could be a trigger is when they disagree with the prompt and a choice, and that's a given, that's any child, it's gonna be a trigger for any child, like when they, they don't like a consequence or they don't like uh, something that they need to do or a routine or they ask them to, to clean up something, it's gonna be a trigger. When they don't understand something academically, that's gonna be a natural trigger towards any child, especially if they're autistic when a consequence gets implemented that's another trigger if it's a new consequence that's not part of the routine they're going to be a lot more aggressive they're going to be a lot more upset but as soon as they get used to that new consequence hopefully it won't be as hard to implement and also they'll understand it and it'll be less of a of a back and forth in a sense of them engaging in a behavior in a sense of like let's say if they're hitting someone right aggressively and you implement a consequence and you say well you're not going to be able to play tv today because you hit somebody. 
And then they're like, whoa, I never, I, she's never taking the TV away. I don't like that. And then they're going to, ah, you know, they might like throw a tantrum or, or they might get really upset by engaging in aggressive behaviors. As long as they're safe and they're not hurting anyone, I'm okay with the child engaging in some type of aggressive to let it out. But there's, there's obviously like, there's certain lines you can't cross. Some people are not going to agree with that. I completely understand. But when I used to work with mental professionals, some professionals agree with that, some didn't. So it just depends. It really, I think it depends on how well you know the person, if you think it might be healthy or not, if they were exposed with, with aggressive, aggressive behaviors or not. Because if they're already exposed by being abused, uh, that intervention is not going to work. But if it's something where it's a controlled environment or they've never been exposed by aggressive behavior, say, you know what, why don't, if you feel really angry, why don't you just punch the pillow, you know, punch it. Uh, things like that that's just an example that i can give now another thing that i can uh, another trigger that i've noticed is when they get nervous that's normal too you know a lot of people they start to get triggered when they're nervous when their feelings and concerns don't get validated that's another very natural response towards any child uh and especially if they're autistic not getting access to electronics is a huge trigger for people for kids now regardless if you're if you're autistic or not, <laughs> you're gonna get triggered if you don't have access to your, to your electronics. And especially if it's a part of your routine, you're gonna get triggered or they're gonna get triggered. So just be mindful of that stuff. Um, now I'm gonna talk about the interventions. The interventions is part, pretty much the meat of what's gonna help the child and teen or adult succeed if they're exhibiting behaviors or, or certain triggers that they can't seem to get a hold of or in a sense of get control of that trigger so that it doesn't control them. Um, so the interventions is super important. The biggest thing about interventions and coping skills is making sure you're consistent, making sure you rotate them, making sure that you change different ones, making sure that you modify um, constantly just trying different ones because you just don't know which is are going to work and which is are, are not going to work because every child is different. They have different personalities. People are just into, into different things. Now let's, let's just get into it. All right. Legos. 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 I've noticed that Legos help autistic children tremendously, like a lot. Um, building blocks those magnet things that you guys see they're very expensive but they're super super helpful when a child is autistic playing with sand all that good stuff like anything that has to do with building oh they get to be doing that all day which helps them not be within the like if you had a choice within electronics and building things i would encourage you to encourage them to focus on legos blocks sand building things like that um cooking is another thing because a lot of the times autistic children might be a little tactile, like they like to touch things, you know? And cooking is a big, big way of kind of showing their strengths and teaching them things and fun and being messy and all that good stuff. Another example that I could give you is, like I said, tactile means like touching, you know, like sand, water, building with block. I used to make sensory uh, stations and boxes. You could definitely do that. You could definitely make a sensory area for your child where it's like this is your space you could do whatever you want here you can make a mess throw things touch whatever but this is your space <laughs> all the other spots you can do that but you can definitely do what you want to do here you know here's your sand here's your blocks you want to draw this this is here and hopefully as you keep reinforcing that and reminding them eventually they're gonna know okay i can do this at my own time in my own space and be happy like it just they feel like they're being her like they're like okay they're they're really embracing my my hobby what i'm into because if i want to be dirty let me be dirty and, and, and mess around and then i'll clean up at the end you know <laughs> little things like that it makes a huge difference when you give them a little little section for them to be their own selves and just embrace who they are okay um coloring is a big thing too any type of coloring or arts and crafts they'll love um give them options to get some space for 20 minutes in a safe area is big like remind them like you want some space do you want 20 minutes you know, we could go back and talk about it do you want to go to your room all that remind them because a lot of the times even with any child just reminding them about their choices is going to help them like oh yeah yeah i do want to and then they go and they do it because when you're angry sometimes you don't think about your your interventions and coping skills explain with minimal words and communicate one step at a time one of the things that I noticed with autism is 
Ooh, I don't even remember how my supervisor used to say it because she would always try to explain to me like you kind of have to be straightforward with minimal words. Like pick up the trash from the floor and put it inside the trash can. You can't just say take the trash out. You have to be specific but not too detailed so that it's kind of to the point and to the task. And that's with anything when someone is autistic. So don't use so many words, just one thing at a time, one step at a time. And eventually they'll be able to capitalize it. Allow them to track and write down the routine for the day. Get a mini calendar. This helps them because they love routines. It'll help you understand their routine too so they, they feel supported at whatever age they are. And it helps you kind of like understand like what are they into? What, what do they want to put in the routine? How can I help them adjust the routine? You can help them be more successful with the routines if you start to do it now at a younger age. Use incentives and verbal praise for progress and good behaviors after they have completed their tasks or directions given by an adult. This is a common thing. Any Anyone loves praises, rewards. It's like we all do it, even as adults. And I give you an example. Like uh, when brands send you guys gifts or they send people gifts, they're rewarding them. You know, they're rewarding them in some sense, like, oh, thank you for talking about my stuff. Thank you for saying something positive. Um, but that's an example. You know, it's like they're trying to reward certain behavior so that they can continue to do it. Now you could do the same thing with kids. Uh, reward positive behavior so they can recognize, oh, okay, if I keep doing this, mom and dad are gonna keep rewarding me because I'm earning it versus just giving it to me. And then, oh, my mom and dad are, or my caregivers are giving me a consequences because I'm not doing this right. And hopefully, and then slowly but surely it starts to click. The more that you do it, the more that you're consistent, the better it's gonna be a routine. And it's gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be such a hard thing to implement and for them to respond to. Another thing is purchase earplugs to help them reduce loud noises they can't control. Earplugs is such a big, I used to recommend earplugs all the time. You know, like, especially because a lot of the times you're not, you're not gonna be able to control your environment's noises or you're gonna go to a party or a, a concert or a place that you can't really avoid the loud noises I definitely recommend earplugs and I definitely recommend those things I've seen children with those things like you know and it helps if you if the child feels comfortable wearing those why not you know recommend them make them beautiful decorate them make them look really um, be artsy you know you could totally make it into a thing where it's fun like oh look I got you these headphones let's decorate them you know, let's make it into an activity. You could definitely decorate the headphones, um, anything that they use, decorate and make it their own so that they feel special and it could be like a, a bonding time for you guys. Another thing that I would always recommend is enroll them in an activity or sports. I know that some recreational activities don't provide the correct support. So just be careful where you go and where you decide to put your child in because of course there is people out there that will wanna take advantage of children that are disabled or have any mental disorders. So although I do recommend recreational activities, make sure that wherever you take them, they have the correct support and they're safe there, okay? I wouldn't even recommend a parent to, to leave them there. I would say stay. I mean, I would stay with my son when he would go to certain practices. Unfortunately, I live in a town where there's a lot of pedophiles and I'd just rather be safe and I'd just rather just be there and make sure that my son's safe. And you could definitely do the same thing with your child who's autistic because you just never know. Tutoring to improve language barriers. Tutoring is gonna help tremendously with anything that they're struggling with. If you are, have access to tutoring and the school's providing it or it's free, if, you, if, if it's offered, I would wholeheartedly recommend for you to accept it for your child because any help is, is better than no help because sometimes there's language barriers within the home because maybe the parent only knows Spanish and if they're offering it, take it, you guys. Like, just take it, <laughs> you know? Like, because uh, sometimes we can become prideful. As, as just humans, depending on your culture or your your ethnicity, your pride could be a little bit more stronger than others, but it don't matter. We all struggle with pride. But help goes a long way. And if they're offering it, it's okay to take it. <laughs> Stay consistent with reward with the reward system. The rewards are pretty much consisted of little cotton balls that would reach certain prizes as a child kept doing good things. So it's a reward system. So as the more good things that they did and they kept seeing the good things that they were doing because of the balls that they were obtaining and every time they would reach a reward, they would get that reward and they would get to choose the reward so it would be more motivating. And of course the rewards had to be obtainable by the parents. Like we couldn't pick rewards that were like, 
oh, give me $100. Oh, no, no. You know, if the family couldn't afford $100, then we weren't going to do that. We're going to do something that the child and the team was going to be satisfied on top of the parent being able to sustain that reward right after me leaving. Because we wanted to make sure that, that the parents and caregivers were able to provide certain rewards and certain incentives that they were able to afford and provide once we were gone because that's just not fair for us to set them up in a place where oh dang like you know this person was giving this and that and i can't afford that and it's just it's not right so just making sure that you you guys collaborate together as as a as as caregivers and with the child to make sure that you guys both meet in the middle the main thing is the child really has to want this thing and then at the same time you guys have to be honest with them like well you know what i can't really we can't really get that but maybe we can do this and then kind of negotiate and figure out and meet in the middle the other thing that i used to always recommend is encouraging to use their words when they want to talk or when they want to walk out of the classroom or they begin to shut down so encouraging them to use their words it's constantly it's a constant thing like if they were wanting to get upset or like all these things like leaving the, ha the classroom or shutting down encouraging them to use their words was super helpful did it work all the time no but if you're consistent and you remind them to use their words so you can help them problem solve and resolve the issue slowly but surely little by little they will start to use your words model and role play communication and problem solving skills with a moderate tone of voice moderate tone of voice it's a key thing with a tone of voice you can role play model show the child many different things but if you're yelling and you're using too many words you're gonna lose them remind and model substitute words for their foul language use substitute words if the child picks up bad words because you're starting to use bad words just take accountability and start to substitute your own words so that eventually they're gonna start copying you they're gonna model what they see and what they hear as parents caregivers we had to take responsibility when we're modeling certain behaviors and uh, realizing like oh you know like i say this and now i see my child is saying it you can't expect them to stop because when you're autistic, it's it's very repetitive behaviors. If you're doing something repetitive, they're gonna pick it up, they're gonna say it, including violent behavior, including physical aggression. If a parent chooses to hit their child, eventually the autistic child is gonna hit back, especially when they're low spectrum because you're modeling that and that's all they're being shown. So it's like, oh, hit, hit, hit. Okay, maybe I need to hit myself. Is that gonna make me stop? I don't know. You know, those are just little things to kind of think about to not engage in the physical aggression with any child, in my opinion. Remind them if they need a five to 10 minute break or to debrief when they get really upset or frustrated, just reminding them about their options can help a long way. Because sometimes like, even as adults, you know, we'll get really frustrated, we forget about our coping skills. So having a reminder and, and being there in a support system is, is gonna help them so that it becomes a routine and they can remind themselves when they're in that, in that situation. Remind them of their coping skills, you know, to help them regain composure to take a walk or maybe they want some space or maybe they want to talk about it it's all about reminding and supporting especially during their early stages of their life when they're a child and a teen and an adolescent model by asking them to do things instead of demanding it's a big thing modeling if you model to clean the kitchen if you model to do this you model to do that and then you see other kids are modeling the same thing eventually other kids will follow yes there's going to be some kids that are defiant whether they're autistic or not and they're not going to want to and that's where you implement consequences fair consequences and that's how you're able to kind of shift their behavior and then when they start to see the other kids get rewards and then the kid and then the person that's not doing what they're supposed to be doing but they're getting consequence then eventually they're gonna want to start to do these because well they're getting rewards and i'm not i'm getting consequence eventually they're gonna turn around their behavior it's gonna take time they're gonna fight it there's gonna be a very very peak moment where they're gonna be like nope 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 and then eventually it always happens you guys it always happens you just have to be very very consistent and you have to like Put your foot down like don't you don't fold it as a character <laughs> the other thing is ignore unwanted behaviors provide five to ten minute space validate concerns then attempt to problem solve one of the things that we used to always recommend during services is called active ignoring now you would ignore certain behaviors that you wouldn't that you didn't accept what is it called they were called like uh, attention seeking behaviors kind of like crying but you knew the difference between the cryings and it's like, okay, that type of crying, you, and you know, like that they're not really sensitive. They're just trying to get my attention. You would ignore that. And then you will go back to paying attention to other positive behaviors such as, oh mom, look, I finished this. And then you start to pay attention. Or look, mom, I build this Lego. 
by myself. Oh, wow, good job. And But if they're like, mom, 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 it's not coming from, uh, I don't want to say respectful either because respect is different when it comes out to different cultures. That's something that I learned in the field is that respect is in different ways. Um, for some people, that's not disrespectful. For other people, that's kind of disrespectful when they're like, mom, 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 mom. <laughs> but pay attention to the positive behaviors and ignore the unwanted behaviors and you're slowly going to start to see the positive behaviors happen more and the negative behaviors decrease. It's all about consistency and making sure that you're consistent because when you're not consistent, they're not gonna, it's just not gonna grasp. The other thing that I used to say is model how to decrease the verbal tone when they express their concerns. So by you talking in a very low tone and expressing your concerns, they're gonna be able to communicate back to you when they're concerned. So just make sure you continuously model. Model, model, model. You're the example that they're gonna pick up on, praise their good behaviors consistently by saying, good job, good job. I always do that, you guys. Till this day, I still do that. Even <laughs> what I do now currently, and I'm, I'm just a greeter, and I'm constantly saying, thank you, good job, man. Or, you know, I'm just praising, or I'm saying, thank you for, for this, or thank you for picking that up, or thank you for showing me, because there's a lot of things that I'm asking for when members come in in our organization, and I, I'm constantly praising them. I'm constantly saying thank you, I appreciate it, because it's a, it's tough that I'm asking them to, to certain things, and I appreciated that, so that hopefully when they come next time, they're gonna be more inclined to redo the, the routine that we're doing every time they come in, and I agree. <laughs> if, you, if you catch my drift, the other thing, is implement a time out for 20 minutes when they increase their behaviors repeatedly that, that are not safe. You have to implement a time out. Uh, there's ways of implementing, there's so many different ways of implementing time out. There's so many videos out there and on YouTube to implement a time out. Just, I would just recommend that if a child gets really aggressive, making sure that you put them in a room where there's no unsafe object, where there's, yeah, where there's no objects that are unsafe for them remind them of the rules to make sure that they're being safe, to de debrief when they're really upset. It's a trial and error thing. You're gonna start to figure out what works when they need their space, okay? But that's reminding them about that is, is huge too. It's gonna help them a lot. And the last thing that I put here is implement consequences consistently, like a timeout, a like no electronics, limit visit with friends, depending on whatever the child is into, implement the consequences consistently. You have to do it where it hurts because we're not physically hurting the child, right? So we have to give them a consequence that at that moment in time, it's actually going to be, a, like they're gonna feel like, oh, this, this does suck, this sucks. You know, I can't play with my Legos and I'm bored. Oh, and oh, I almost forgot music. Music is another thing that I noticed that autistic people like a lot, music. I didn't wanna forget about that. Like music is another thing that you could definitely go into when it comes out to interventions and coping skills. Maybe do an instrument, you know, listening to music, learning about music, music production. I feel like autistic people would do great with music production because it's so independent and it's very intricate and very repetitive that I feel like autistic people will do fucking amazing in music if they really, really put all their effort in it and passionate and and they're consistent like in the high spectrum because i'm telling you you guys when i when i used to be around people that were autistic in a high functioning level it was like wow like wow like you're really smart like in different ways like i can do that you know like their memory was impeccable in certain areas it's just it was amazing okay oh i wrote down right here rotate 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 it's important that you rotate all these interventions and coping skills it is extremely important don't stick with one if one doesn't work rotate it sometimes one is going to work depending on the age depending on how they're feeling what they're going through the situation that triggered them it depends so just rotate it's not a one size fits all you have to keep changing and modifying for with within the child's personality how they are what they're into it just depends on the child and the personality, okay? Because you have to think about it. a lot of the times the ch children that I worked with were were um, were boys, so I could just I don't you know I don't even have that many information in regards to like girls like autistic girls. And one thing that I will say is that I do keep hearing a lot that it's really hard to detect in girls when they're autistic. So just be mindful of that. I've always felt like I was like in the high spectrum autism. I know I'm like diagnosing myself but i requested to get tested the last time i spoke to my therapist but it never happened i was like hey you know i've always had this feeling 
that I was autistic, but I don't know. And I want to just rule it out so I can just leave it like out of my head because if I'm not, like I just want to like stop thinking that, you know. Like, but if I am, it's gonna help me understand certain routines. Uh, but it never happened. I think I will pursue it eventually once everything settles down with my new position, our new work position with my health insurance and stuff. Now going back to the barriers, okay? We're gonna talk about barriers. There's a certain things that we used to talk about when we would create our meetings. I would talk about barriers that we needed to overcome. And these are just small little barriers that I noticed that some children may struggle with if they're autistic. And number one is peers and adults engaging in aggressive behaviors. That's very common. If they see peers and adults engage in aggressive behaviors, they're gonna pick up on that routine and they're gonna do it. And it's really difficult to undo it if they continuously see it. Especially if you're seeing movies, television shows, YouTube videos that have a very violent behavior, they're just more prone to copying it they just are it's yeah so just be mindful of that the person shutting down and refusing to communicate could be a huge barrier when they're autistic because it's you know it's hard for them with the whole emotional stuff and being able to um, detect sadness or not being able to understand certain feelings and emotions so that's why it could be a very difficult barrier because they'll shut down and they're not going to want to communicate another thing is inconsistent with the interventions and coping skills and the medication could be a huge barrier if you're inconsistent with anything it's going to become a barrier a huge barrier lack of communication or inconsistent communication between the family uh, mental health services the school and just anyone that is involved with the child inconsistent communication is a huge barrier that i've noticed so just make sure that you are on the same page with the teachers with the mental health providers with any treatment team ieps all that stuff make sure you guys are on the same page and you're communicating consistently ask for language um, support ask for an interpreter because if you only speak spanish or you speak chinese or mandarin or any other language that's not english they are legally have to provide an interpreter whether it's a school mental health provider anyone any company they legally have to provide an interpreter is it hard yes but you need an interpreter so that at least you understand what's what's happening and if you can try to get a mental health professional that speaks bilingual or that speaks spanish or that speaks any language the language that you speak of even better but i know that it's difficult the good thing is that nowadays we're seeing a lot more people that are that speak different languages that are providing mental health services so hopefully it's not as hard anymore and hopefully with this video and the links that i'm going to leave it'll point you to the right directions at the type of services that you can get to help your child be successful because there's a lot of resources out there you guys there's regional center regional center is services that could be provided as an infant all the way to as an adult and then they can live independently eventually when they become adults there's just a lot of services out there and that they can help you and the child be successful and for it not to be such a hard journey, you know, with, and, and get support throughout all the stages that they go through. Okay. Now the highlights and successes. One of the highlights that I've noticed is they respond positively towards rewards and praises. They, they just do. Any human does. I mean, who doesn't? They increase their communication between family members and the primary mother learning how to discuss concerns and ask questions. So you start to see that they're more verbal, that they're more vocal. And you're like, wow, it's working because it's consistent. And that's why TBS services work so well because we're there three times out of the week, three hours and a half at a time. Because I know I said three hours. First I said four, then I said three. But now I remember it was like three hours and 30 minutes that we used to be there. And it was a constant routine. And it was a constant thing. I would go there and we would do these interventions and coping skills three times out of the week. So the parent could see, because I would model, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to model and I'm going to teach and show. And I'm going to see what's going to work and what doesn't. And hopefully the parent eventually is going to pick it up. And then by the end of the last month is when the parent starts to kind of take over my role. And they're kind of like, okay, now I'm going to start doing what she's doing. Now she's going to step away and she's just going to observe now, you know, it's going to see what other uh, suggestions and, and advice she, she can provide and other things that I'm, I might be able to work on or could work on with the child so that we can continue to be successful once these services um, leave the household or the school. And I would do the same thing with the teachers. I would model, teach them how to respond to the child. I would tell them, you know, it's because of the tone and, you know, sometimes unfortunately some people didn't want to listen as adults which was really sad so if you're an adult if you're the if you're a professional if you're a teacher if you have a client that's autistic and a professional comes in try to give suggestions recommendations 
and you're not being open, it's going to be super hard for the child to even be successful because the child is going to see that you guys can't even work as a team. <laughs> and if you guys can't even work as a team, the child's not going to want to try. They're just not going to want to try. You know, they're, they're very, children are really smart, regardless if they're autistic or not. They're really smart and they pick up on things like that. So if everybody becomes a team player and they all listen to each other's constructive criticism and listen to each other's um, suggestions and trying each other's ideas, it flows a lot better because you're hearing each other's ideas, you're implementing them and you get to see which ones work and which ones don't. And you leave it at that. Don't get stuck on like who was right and who was wrong. Just be happy that something worked and it's becoming successful and the child is, is happy. And that's the main goal. Is the child happy after the services? That's the main goal. And the family too as well. Are they happy already? Do they feel like they've reached some of their goals where they feel like, okay, I can do this. This is possible. There, there can be change in a positive manner. Now I'm going to talk about the adult experience. I was an independent living instructor. It reminds me of the negative outcomes of what someone who's autistic might endure while they're kids or even a teen or as a transition as an adult because unfortunately a lot of people who are disabled will encounter abuse whether it's physical verbal or financial abuse they will abuse the child because they're gaining financial gain they will basically they will they'll take their money you know not utilize the money for things that are necessary for the child's ability to be successful in life um they steal from them as, as, as they grow up. And as they get older, they slowly start to pick up on those patterns, depending if they're very high functioning, because when you're low functioning, I mean, it's like, you can't even, you won't even pay attention. You won't even recognize like that the hitting is wrong because unfortunately some, some who are low functioning are gonna hit you and they're gonna get, we don't know if, if they get hit or some, some children get hit, but there is cases out there where they get hit. Cause I don't wanna say that just because an autistic child chooses to hit is because they're getting hit but it is a possibility it could be a tick it could be that it's not a learned behavior and it could be learned behavior we have to be honest about that conversation but the financial financial one was a shock to me because i mean i knew it happened to the elderly community i just did, didn't realize that it happened so much to intellectually disabled adults and children and they were very vocal when i used to work with adults about certain you know incidents that they would would, would have with their caregivers and and how some caregivers would disown them, you know? Some caregivers choose to not have a relationship with their autistic um, adult uh, child. It was really sad. That's why when I used to be an instructor, I tried my best to be like a family member. My heart kind of took over that position sometimes and I made sure that I wasn't just there to instruct, like I was there as, as, a, as a friend to some extent. People that are in situations like that can still get taken advantage of, even even from far away. You know, they could still be hurt, and that it, it helps me understand why this person was so attached to certain items. You know, because I don't know what that item meant to that person. You know, if it was a correlation to the abandonment, you know, of their family because they they didn't really visit visit them even as an adult they didn't get visited it's just sad and a lot of a lot of intelli intellectual adults um deal with that you know where their family kind of disown disown them and they just allow the county or services to just kind of take care of them and it's kind of like they have zero zero communication with their family and sometimes it's by choice and sometimes it's not and by choice, I mean because they've been taken advantage of and they just choose not to talk to their family. And other times it's because, you know, they've been abused and it's just like they choose not to even engage with their family members because they kind of are cognitively smart enough to realize that they deserve better. And they do. Everybody deserves to be taken care of, to not be taken advantage of, to be treated with love and respect. Um, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. I know that I've gone through my phases and stuff where I'm really mean to certain, <laughs> certain things that I say certain comments. But in my heart, I know that everybody deserves to be treated the, like humans regardless. R regardless of a disability, regardless of a disorder, regardless of any mental disorder, and vice versa. Whether you have a disorder or you have a mental health disability or a barrier, you should always respect people and treat people the way they should be treated the way what was that one thing not the golden rule but the what 
was it? Is it golden sub? Gold? I don't know. But the other one, they kept saying, treat people the way they want to be treated. Not the way you want to be treated because everybody wants to be treated in different ways. You can't assume that everybody wants to be treated the way you want to be treated. Treat people the way they want to be treated. And if they're very vocal about it, respect it, and treat away. <laughs> and hopefully people will return the favor because people who, are, who do communicate are usually will reciprocate. So those are the ones to keep as friends and families, to keep them around, all right? So even though I did kind of end a little heavy in a sense of like how some people might get taken advantage of when they're dealing with any type of disabilities, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and there is a lot of support and help out there. For anyone who's an adult or a child that needs help, it's the main thing is about advocacy, it's about using your words, it's about not giving up and advocate, advocate, advocate. I used to always tell parents, children, always advocate for yourself, don't give up. Depending on the school system, depending on where you live, sometimes it's so hard to get these services, but the more that you keep trying, don't give up. They, they eventually, eventually you're gonna get something because you a fighter. And I'm, I've been like, I've always been that way. I don't give up, I just keep going. When I wanna reach a goal, I don't give up and I keep doing it and I keep doing it. And I try to teach the families that I work with the same type of techniques so that they don't get um, discouraged or lost Especially because when you're only a, only speak, a, you know, you don't speak English and it's hard. It's hard. It's really, really hard. So don't give up. Keep trying. Utilize the things that I recommended. If you have any questions, please comment down below. If you have any suggestions, if you know any services that I missed, that I didn't touch on, if there's something that you want to correct me on, you can call Harley Correct Me on. I, I'm okay with constructive criticism. If I said something wrong, please correct me. I tried my best to provide as much information as I can. This video is gonna be really, really long, but I hope that it helps anyone. And I am gonna make a dedicated video about TBS services, like super dedicated video because TBS services were provided for children who struggled with aggression, verbal aggression and defiant behavior, and they didn't have to be autistic. They just, they just struggle with that. And a lot of the times, a lot of our, our clients were diagnosed with depression and anxiety. So that's why I do want to dedicate a video specifically just to talk about therapeutical services because this specific program could be provided, it could be modified, it could be changed, it could be provided by any organization. And it's super helpful because of the way that it's set up because it's super intense, you guys, okay? But anyway, Bob, I'm going to let you go. Hopefully everybody has a good... I don't even know. Hopefully everybody has a good... I don't even know. <laughs> Hopefully you guys had a good like rest of the year because I know it's been tough. Like I've said before, I'm not gonna stop doing these mental health videos. Thank you for continuing to watch. Thank you for continuing to support. And remember, coping skills are not a one size fits all. Make sure that you take care of yourself. Make sure that you practice self care. Make sure you check in on yourself and don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard. That's something I've always taken since I've gone therapy this whole last year. Don't be so hard on yourself. Take it one day at a time. All right. Bye, guys. Talk to you later.